All right, gang, I've got the top of the hour. Um, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, my name is Brian Reel with uh, Computer Aid Technology slash Go Engineer. Uh, we have a couple of presenters today. Uh, we'll start off with Andy Barnes from uh, Dassault SolidWorks, who's going to talk to us a little bit about 3D Pattern Shape Creator. Um, no PowerPoint, going right into the software, which is awesome. Um, and then we have our own uh, Todd Myers and Jay Padero, who are going to uh, talk about some of the differences between uh, SolidWorks Desktop PDM and moving to 3D Experience PDM. Uh, same but different and better uh, is, kind of, is part of their title. I'll let you guys go into more detail when you get to that. Uh, but uh, for now, Andy, I believe you are the presenter. So if you would like to start sharing your screen, we'll get this meeting rolling. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, so today, I am going to be talking about 3D Pattern Shape Creator, and I'm just going to try and successfully share my screen, which I don't think I did. Yep, you're coming through. We can see Is it, it SolidWorks or a browser? Uh, it's SolidWorks. SolidWorks. Yeah, so we got to go to the other screen. <laughs> what about now? Perfect. Did it. You did it. So my my entire presentation is actually going to be inside of a web browser. I'm going to be inside of a Chrome browser the entire time. Um, uh, I'm going to be working on some stuff that comes from X apps, like uh, browser-based 3D experience model design apps, like you may have heard, like X Shape or X Design. Um, but everything that I'm creating geometry on could absolutely have come from SolidWorks, right? Um, come from a step file if you want. Um, so remember that as I'm going through this, like all of the geometry that I'm creating could absolutely be done on a SolidWorks file, and then it can be put back into SolidWorks. So everything that I'm creating here uh, can be created as a NURB surface, uh, it, or, or it, it is getting generated as NURB surface, B rep, it's ready to go back into SolidWorks. Circles are circles, planes are planes, none of this tessellated stuff, right? Uh, so important to remember. Now, uh, you may have noticed that I got a bunch of records behind me. Uh, this is my record collection. Not all of them, it's a few of them, but uh, these are my pattern ones, right? So if you're wondering like, what does 3D Pattern Shape Creator do? Um, it does stuff where we can create patterns that are like way above and beyond what we could do in SolidWorks. Um, to the point that like we can actually create geometry that would literally be impossible to create in SolidWorks. I recently did a perforated facade for a building that had 35,000 holes in it. Um, and I was able to dump it back into SolidWorks with 35,000 holes. Now, if you imagine, don't, don't try this at home, people. Do not try <laughs> to go to SolidWorks and create a linear pattern that's 35,000 holes. You will probably break SolidWorks. That is expected. <laughs> that, is a, that is an expected behavior. It's not a bug. Um, it's just not built for it, right? Um, and this kind of software that I'm about to show you is built for exactly that. Um, so let's get to it. Uh, what I have up on my screen here is actually a like a handle uh, it's actually a handle for uh, the miter saw. You may have seen like the old miter saw demo back in the day for SolidWorks. Um, and what I've actually done here is uh, <laughs> is open the wrong file. That's what I've done. Uh, so I'll get out of that and I'll open up my correct file here, which I think is this one actually. Um, and in this one, what I've done too is I've kind of prepped it by splitting out an area. There we go. I've actually split out an area that I want to create a pattern on, okay? So inside of here, you can kind of see if we start hiding some stuff. If I, if I hide this, I'm just looking right here, and now I can just see uh, the area that I wanna see, which is the area that I wanna create a pattern on. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is actually uh, start creating my pattern, and I'm gonna do that by popping open this other window here uh, called the uh, display graph and I'll go in here and take a look at the display graph and what I'm going to do is start creating a bunch of nodes um, and I'm going to connect a bunch of the nodes together. Um, my wife's actually a fourth grade teacher um, and they do like, uh, I forget what the heck it's called, like a, a week of code or something like that um, everywhere and, and it's actually like what they do is they have these cool little uh, 
uh, things for kids to like get into how to create code. And what they have is basically like building blocks of, of code. It's, it's, it's not like you're writing like a, a script of code. It's like you have a chunk that does this and a chunk that does that. And as you connect them together, you connect them all together and it does like a specific thing. Um, I think that's actually how the Lego ones work. Um, and actually, uh, just needed to hit refresh right there. I think something funky was happening. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I actually have these like chunks of code that I can connect together with nodes. But the first thing I have to do is get my geometry in there. So I'll do that by clicking on input. And now I've got this input here. And now I can start doing stuff to it. Um, like I can say, I want to tra triangulate, triangulate the surface. And I can say, create a triangle approximately every 10 millimeters. And I add that there. And now I've got a, a triangle every 10 millimeters or so, right? It's able to grab the surface and quickly create 266 triangles that are all attached together. Now I could do something like create a fill surface for each one of those triangles. So I just drag it out, I hit fill, and now I've got a filled surface for every single triangle. Right. And I just did that in like half a second. Like imagine how you would do that in SOLIDWORKS, right? I have I have a, a bunch of individual uh, uh, closed contours and I want to add, uh, you know, let's say I have 10 closed contours and I want to add a filled surface into each one of them. I have to create 10 filled surface commands, right? Um, with this, it's just saying, hey, when, whatever is in here, dump it in there. Um, and so, you know, lightning fast, I can create 266 filled surfaces, right? Now, uh, what I have here is 266 surfaces, and I'm going to use the assemble node to just kind of assemble them all together, kind of like a knit, right? And now, now I'm all knitted together. And then from there, I can say, I want to grab the sub elements. Specifically, I want to grab all of the vertices of those triangles. And now I have points for every vertice for every triangle, right? So in no time at all, I've got approximately, you know, well, it's not 266 anymore. It is, we can find out pretty easily, 144 individual points approximately evenly spread by 10 millimeters around the surface. So now if I wanted to, I could say create a sphere um, with a radius of, let's say, two millimeters, and I can grab one for at, at the center of every single one, right? And I'll go ahead and hide this stuff, and now I've got a sphere for every single one, right? That's kind of boring though, right? So what I'll do instead is, I know I'm gonna reuse this surface a whole bunch. So what I'm actually gonna do is call it, uh, we'll call it grip, grip surface. And then I'm gonna create, I'm gonna save it as a favorite. So now it's a favorite. And then I'm gonna go back over here and I'm gonna do uh, my boundary command. And now I can select this as a favorite and I'll be able to select it the entire time. So what boundary is, is boundary is kind of like convert entities. When you select a face, uh, you can do convert entities of a face and you get the edges around the outside of the face, right? So now I've got these edges. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell it why don't you grab the distance between all of these points and the edges? And now in no time at all, it's given me specific distances. And what this actually does is let's say for that point right there, it's giving me the closest point linearly to any to, to either of these curves, right? So it's it's grabbing, not only is it like, it's not like the center of it, it's like the closest possible point to this one, right? So now that I've got a distance there, now I can relate that distance to the sphere size, right? So I'm gonna say, um, if I grab stats, from there, I can get the minimum distance, the maximum distance, mean, but I can also get the this normalized thing, right? And what, what normalized does is it basically takes the highest one and it's, uh, one and the lowest one is zero and then it gives you an even gradient throughout all of them so the one that's halfway is 0.5 right and now what i can do is i can put that into my curve evaluator node 
and I'm going to say I want my minimum size radius to be 0.5 millimeters and I want my maximum size radius to be three millimeters and now I can just dump that in there and now I've got a bunch of sizes that are between 0.5 and 3. So now put that in here. There you go. And now dependent upon how close it is to the edge, we get a different size sphere. And you'll notice there, this graph that I get right here, this curve evaluator is actually a uh, linear relationship, right? Um, but I can change that curve to kind of change uh, the, uh, uh, how large it is, right? So now, so if I put it up here, right, it stays larger longer, right? Stays larger and longer. If I flip it like this, right, I'll, it's the it's basically the acceleration of which uh, the the change in size happens, right? So you can create some wild stuff that you could really never never expect to do in SolidWorks. Uh, one of the other things I like to show is I could also grab a point by coordinates. And it automatically dumps onto the origin. And since this part was created in the context of an assembly, the origin is actually out there. But I can just drag this origin or drag the point. So, so I, I actually I can work in the graphical area, or I can work in the uh, graph editor, and I can swap back and forth between the two at any time. Right? It really doesn't matter. So now. What I'm going to do is rather than grabbing the distance to the boundary, I'm going to grab the distance to uh, this point. Now, what it actually did is it's it's actually saying like, hey, the closer it is, the smaller the radius. I want the inverse of that. So I can actually use normal inverse right here instead, and it updates, right? And now you can see as I move this around, right, everything updates. Right, so you could create you could create a scenario where you say, hey, like the highest grip, you know, the highest amount of whatever needs to be right where like the finger portion of the trigger would be, or maybe it's maybe it's where the palm would would rest out here, right, and quickly get those updates, uh, which I think is is pretty slick. So what we'll do from there is I'll actually say, you know what, the spheres are cool and everything, but really what I want is like kind of like a, a hexagonal pattern, right? So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to uh, create what is called a Voronoi. And to do that, I want to kind of explain what a Voronoi is. Um, and this is actually, I actually meant to start with this. <laughs> I'm all out of sorts today, people. Um, but in here are some examples of uh, different patterns that I've created. Um, at different points and they'll probably load up in a minute here what i need to do is go over to my voronoi example here as soon as i get this to pop up yeah so over here uh you can see this uh, is kind of a uh a gif uh it's an example of you got these points and then if you imagine uh, uh, circles coming out from these points, radiating out, radiating out from the points, really spheres. Um, what you end up with is you end up with a line at the midpoint between two points that's perpendicular to that line, and that's how all of these things get cordoned off. And like, why is that special? Right, because nature uses it. Right, the every corner of the cob. Right, that's a Voronoi pattern. Right, uh, we have uh, supposed to be looking at. A different <laughs> supposed to be looking at it. I was like screwing around, uh, testing out a bunch of stuff uh, for a demo, and I totally got a bunch of stuff in the wrong spot. Uh, you know, here's bees, right? A dragonfly wing, uh, right? That's a Voronoi pattern. The way like bubbles pack together in nature, obviously a giraffe, classic example of a Voronoi, right? But why is this important, right? Well, you know, people use it now to make their products like look really cool, right? Um, here's a running shoe, right? And it's not just things like running shoes, like it is everything. I was in a uh, Target the other day um, and uh, there was a, a fabric softener, 
that had some wild like pattern on it that was created with a program like this. You know, like your fabric softener does not need to have a cool pattern on it. It's literally just to get it to set to, to be uh, 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 set apart from other things on the shelf, right? Um, there's like a air mister or something or other that had a, a wild pattern on it too. Um, you know, so so it could be something functional like a grip pattern, but it could also just be, you know, like, hey, we want like what sets our product apart from the one next to it on the shelf. Um, so that's what a Vornoy is. And we're going to uh, take advantage of Vornoy here. So I think if I'm very careful, I can do that. There we go. I have like multiple monitors running here and that's why it's kind of, normally uh, when I have this running, I have this on two separate monitors, which is fantastic. So much real estate, but for the benefit of you guys, I'm doing it uh, with just one screen. So it gets a little trickier when you're like moving stuff around here. Um, but I'm going to just grab a Vornoy um, and I'm going to give it a skin. I'm going to say, I want the Vornoy to be on the grip surface skin and I'm going to input these points into it. And basically what it's going to do is everywhere there's a point, right, it creates one of those Voronoi cells, right? So now uh, I'll actually just get rid of the spheres. Don't need those anymore. And what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to grab boundary of all the faces. So now I've got uh, like convert entities of all the faces. And then I'm going to do a curve parallel which is kind of like an offset sketch, but it's more like that uh, offset uh, surface command. Now I'm, I'm blanking on what it's called, but it got released in, uh, it, was an, it was a new enhancement to SOLIDWORKS a few years ago, where you could actually create an offset sketch on a 3D surface and um, pretty cool. Uh, so that's actually what this is. And uh, what I'm gonna do with it is I'm going to control the offset of each cell by this. And I'm gonna say, I want the smallest offset to be 0.25 millimeters. And I want the largest one to be two millimeters. And I want this curve, each one of these curves, and I want them to be on the grip surface. And we'll do our Vornoi now. Now you can kind of see uh, it's actually inverse, right? So I have the smaller offset here and the larger offset in the middle, um, which does make sense because I'm, I'm, I want the cell to be bigger uh, in the middle and, um, and that would mean a smaller offset because it's the stuff I'm taking away from the cell. Um, so no big deal, just like I did before with the spheres. I just go, I just say, rather than do the inverse, use the regular one, right? And it'll rebuild. Okay, looking good there. And now I do have this issue. I have a bunch of like sliver faces essentially. And, and it's basically because it's trying to do the offset of the other side of the face as well. And because I got points around the edge here, a lot of the faces around the edge are kind of like half cells, right? So I just want to get rid of those like half cells. And that's another really cool thing is, is I'm, I'm not just creating a pattern on a face like we might do with traditional parametric modeling. I'm creating a bunch of rules based around parameters and creating a bunch of logic, right? So the geometry can update, and if as long as the logic is there, everything stays the same, or everything doesn't stay the same, it changes, but it uh, it updates accordingly so that the logic is followed. So what I want to do this time is I'm going to create another distance node, and this one's going to be from the boundary to each of the faces that get created. And then, uh, so now I have the distance to those faces and some of them are gonna be zero, right? And those are the ones that are actually touching the boundary. So what I can do is uh, go less than, and I love this, I, this whole time I've been just basically searching for commands, right? You can go down here and you can, uh, uh, there's a bunch of commands, like I can go in here and there's a whole bunch of commands that I've already used. Uh, like there's the curve parallel button, right? And the other cool thing is it gives you almost like a, it's almost like a SolidWorks help menu of every single product, but it's like literally built in, right? You click it here and it's built in. It tells you like, it will take lines, 
planes, volumes, vertices, right? And what it, what it, what's going to output? It's going to output a uh, uh, a distance, right? It's going to output a distance, and all, optionally you can also give it a direction. So you could say you could say distance in a particular direction, like uh, the distance in the x-axis or something, right? Um, so, anyways. Uh, as I'm just typing stuff though, it's smart enough to know that when I type less, we don't have a button for less, but we do have one for inferior or inferior or equal, right? So that's what I'm gonna put in. Uh, and I'm gonna say if it's inferior or equal to zero. So now I've got a bunch of true false values, right? So if it's true, then it is inferior or equal to zero. And then what I can do is I can run a dispatch on that to basically say, okay, use this as the index and then give me these faces. So now everywhere where there was a true value, I get an empty node, okay? And now I can simply uh, say, grab this and input it into here. And anything that was coming out of there is now going into here. And now these ones are gonna go away. Right, so now everything that's touching the edge is no longer there. I don't want to create an offset for the things that are touching the edge, right? So now I've created a rule for that. And last thing I'm gonna do, not the last thing, I'm gonna do a bunch more actually. I, I'm gonna do way more things than I have time to do. Um, but I'm gonna do a split. Um, and a split, uh, a split here works just like a split does in SolidWorks, it's like a split face. It's actually, this is, split is actually more like a trim command. Um, than it is like a split face command, I should say. Uh, whoops, I actually wanted to do that one, I think. Yeah, because that one already has the empties in it. So now I've got just the faces, and now I'm gonna create another one of these, and I can do that by just saying duplicate. And uh, this one is actually gonna be for the thickness of each one of these and I'm going to use the inverse this time and uh, I'm going to say thick surface and this is going to be my distance value and that's going to be a surface. I know that it always goes the way that I don't want it to. It always points inward and I always want it to point outward. So I'm just going to do flip orientation and now we'll see these pop out just like the six thick surface inside of SOLIDWORKS. And now I'll just kind of uh, hide all of these cells can we, so we can kind of see what's going on here, right? These ones that are closer to the edge are like 0.25 millimeters. And then these ones out here are like one millimeter. Wait, yeah, they are. Okay, good. Yep, cool, cool. And another thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, a color gradient and I want to I want to make the colors a little different on this say like purple to teal and I think I still want to do normal inverse and then we'll say color rise I never grab color rise the right way color rise those objects with this color ah, i did get it wrong i know a lot of you guys are worried about this the purple should be in the middle come on now oh did i get it wrong again there we go yeah the purple should be in the middle come on now cool uh so now if i go back and show this point and I start moving this point around. A little slower now because it's got to do a lot more stuff, right? It's got to uh, create a Voronoi. It's got to uh, do an offset of all those edges, split them, and then uh, create the thickness, right? But you can see how I might be able to uh, do that, right? And, you know, you think about how long that would take in SolidWorks, right? A lot longer, right? So, and I can also say like, okay, now I want to do like a, a, a pretty huge change, right? This literally changes everything. So now I'm basically making everything smaller.
So now it's calculating all the distances. Uh, it's doing that uh, offset curve, the curve parallel. You can actually see it. It'll highlight as it as it runs through, right? So now it's it's doing this one, and then eventually it'll create the thicken, and then it will colorize it. There we go. And then this one would be a less drastic drastic change because really this is just affecting like these nodes on down, right? Now um, you may have noticed this pattern, you know, isn't really even hexagons the whole way. Um, and and really like you know like do I have to create this from scratch every single time? Absolutely not. Um, what a lot of companies do is they have a uh, a, a family of patterns right they have a brand line where like you see you see that pattern you see that color tone and you know like oh this product is made by so and so right and i associate that with quality right um so uh so what you could do is you could create uh, a bunch of uh uh user operators is what we call them uh which is basically like hey i'm going to combine all of these pieces of code that i put together and make that one chunk of code and now i can apply that to whatever right so i could actually organize all this very simply just by putting it all in a box and then saying hey i want to organize this thing right now it's nice and neat and then from there i could create a user operator and i could like create my own button essentially and I've actually done that. Um, I've actually done that in another one, and I've saved it into a library called Pattern Library here. And since I have that loaded, I actually have this thing called Cylindrical Triangular Grid. And if I dump that in here, you'll see what I need. Pattern Surface. Okay, I got that. That's my grip surface, right? And then I need a cross-sectional plane. And there actually is a cross-sectional plane in here. It's what the uh, sketch was drawn on. So it's actually that one right there. So if I go here and now it's looking for an input, go over here and say that's the cross-sectional plane. Now it's actually creating um, a more triangular pattern, right? So you can see these are more evenly spaced, right? It's more of a triangular pattern. And those are the points that I want to use now. And if I wanted to, this is just a little button, you know, that I created. If I wanted to, though, I could actually like expand this and say, actually, what's in there? All that stuff. <laughs> right? So it's like, it's like a ton of extra uh, stuff, but it just shows up as, you know, it's, it's just one little button. Right? Um, so actually, I'll do is move this really up here. It's actually much easier to work with this thing when it's not expanded like this. I think there's a way for me to uh, chunk it back down, right? I'm blanking on it right now. Oh, 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 wait, it's up here. Yeah, there we go. Ta-da, now it's just, and you can do that with anything, uh, with any uh, region box that but but now i'm basically just going to put this relay up here which is all those points and here's my points from before and i'm basically going to go all that stuff that you're putting there do here instead and now it's going to reference the other points go ahead and hide that too so now it's it's going through and calculating all this stuff I think it is maybe i got screwed up there we go sometimes when you try and do multiple things like while it's in like the the run stage um it stops doing its run i think i think it like thinks you're like still changing stuff and it's like oh well you're still changing stuff i'm not going to keep going <laughs> uh so yeah so now uh we have a a more uh, a more uh, regular pattern here, right? And so now 
And I know, I know I'm getting real close to time guys. Uh, so I am going to, I'm very close to done here. Just wanted to show like kind of the final step of this. Well, actually, let me just uh, colorize and for the color, I do black and for the object, you do input of this surface. No, 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 no. I was wrong. Not what I wanted. For that, I'm going to do grip surface. And then I need to hide the original grip surface. And it's empty because I don't know why it's empty. It's, I, I screwed something up. You screwed it up. It's not my fault. You did it. doesn't matter nothing matters nothing ever mattered in the first place all right last step this is important uh you you what we're seeing in here is everything every instance of everything that was ever created and what we want to see is just what we want to see in other physical products and other uh uh programs like SOLIDWORKS, like Xdesign, like Xshape, is just the stuff that we tell it to see because it's not built to see, you know, 30,000 faces. It's built to see, you know, a, a smaller subset. Um, so what we want to do instead is add, add a publish node to just the stuff that we want to end up seeing. And now I can click save. And I'm going to uh, open this up. Yeah, new handle B. I'm going to open this up in X shape, make a couple changes just to show you that all the changes will actually happen. And prove that it will indeed um, update in front of you in a browser without having to install anything. And all the updates always happen automatically. I don't have to worry about updating my program or installing anything. I absolutely love it. All right. So now if I went back here and I said, hey, I want to change this sketch. It's uh, turning red because it's because um, it's angry. No, I'm just kidding. It's turning red because um, it's it's letting me know that a change has occurred. And now, uh, without even having the software installed, uh, or what, without this would also work if you didn't even have this pattern software. If you were like a different user, um, if you have that pattern in the physical product, it'll actually update that pattern. Um, with the new geometry that you've given it. It just has to go through the amount of time that it would took to like do the whole thing, right? Um, so I thought this would go a little quicker. There we go. <laughs> and then I could also um, change my, uh, my sub D here, do something like this. And then that'll update. So what say you on the on the webinar? What, what do you guys think of all of this? I um, this is Brian. I uh, I don't I don't know what I think right now. My mind's kind of blown into seven different <laughs> directions with all this coolness you're showing here. But uh, yeah, if anyone um, of attendees have questions, you can certainly fill out the question box uh, and submit those. Uh, we don't have any yet, so maybe they're just as speechless as, as I am. Um, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's well, amazing. Hey, I, yeah. 
I'll jump in then if no one else is going to help themselves. Um, and maybe this will get the ball rolling. But uh, this stuff is incredible. And my background's product design. So the amount of time we spent trying to make something look natural uh, was off the charts. To do this in a few steps um, is going to bring that, that um, it's going to catch your eye. It brings that natural. Uh, feel to whatever it is, right? That you're you're trying to modify. Um, what? I got a, just a couple questions, and if someone asks sure. a question, I'll 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 step back. We've got a uh, uh, we've got a phrase that we say in the family when we didn't make enough for dinner and we have guests over. It's family hold back. So I'll hold back if no one else wants to help themselves. But uh, what is the hot key for pulling up that search when you're in that in that field? Without having to go you down just, to the bottom. You just click. You click in the field and you just like oh, literally start typing. Just a mouse yeah. click. Okay, yeah. awesome. Um, when you've got the pattern going there and you were you were referencing the point that you had located roughly in the center, and that's going to give us more of a random shape, not symmetric across the the sides. Yeah. Um, uh, when you have you ever set it up where something is symmetrical and the reference is in a in a central location? Do you see the patterns uh, become symmetric naturally, or is there some randomness without using a random node? So um, you can, if if the if the geometry that you're creating it on is symmetric, um, then the if everything's symmetric, then the pattern will become symmetric. So the like, if all the points, okay. if all the points that go into the Voronoi are symmetric, it will be symmetric. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are, are you referring to that initial like triangulate node that yes. I used? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So for the triangulate node, um, I think if you if you like give it a hexagon, right? A hexagon is actually six triangles, right? A perfect mm -hmm. hexagon is six equilateral triangles, right? Put together. Um, so if you like gave it a hexagon, then I believe it would end up being perfectly symmetric. If you gave it a square, uh, I don't think it ends up being perfectly symmetric, um, even though it could be. It, it, like you could divide a, a square like this, but you don't end up with uh, an equilateral triangle at that point. You end up with an isosceles triangle, and it's trying to create an equilateral triangle. Um, so the short answer is, if the geometry is perfectly symmetric, then it will end up being super perfectly symmetric. But it's really like a best fit. Okay. Um, and there's another, there's actually another uh, tool that's like, uh, it's called uh, uh, surface sample or sample surface sample. Yeah, surface sampling, which does uh, something similar. I basically feed it a number, so I could say like. Give me 200 points on this surface, and it's trying to. It, it's like as as equal as possible. This one's. Le I found it to be less equal, but it's you know. But okay. but as the number decreases, right? If I go to uh, 20, uh, then it's going to be. They'll be less regular. But if I went to a thousand, then it would be more regular if that makes sense yeah okay so, yeah. awesome thanks it's, that, the surface sample one is a funny node because it's like the smaller the number the longer it takes to calculate mm -hmm. if you put mm -hmm. like if you put like 500 on there it does it really quickly it's kind of interesting um, okay i'm probably anyways, gonna I'm get already way over time <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks um well we wanted to have questions um but okay brian are do we have any questions come in or uh no we do not but uh okay. those were good questions that you asked so um, All right. we, we got some more information out of it. So yeah, Andy, this is awesome. Um, if you are good to uh, to pause, I'll switch over to uh, to Todd. Sounds good. Thanks, All everybody. Right. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay. All right, Todd, I'm making you the presenter. All right, cool. Share your screen when you're ready. Oh, which screen am I sharing? Oh boy. Let's see here. We see a browser. That's a Chrome browser. Todd okay, Ford. perfect. All right. All right, so not to be undone by Andy, I I will stay entirely in a browser for this presentation. Um, let's go ahead. 
First thing I'm going to do, though, I'm kind of cheating. Uh, I'm going to drag my presentation into a 3D Play widget. So here we go. Created a little tab here, and we're going to drag and drop that. It is a PowerPoint, but uh, your results may vary if you're trying to present this through 3D Play, um, depending on the font and how it's structured. But anyway, here we go. All right, so uh, Jay, sorry I didn't put you on this slide, uh, but Jay is my wingman. I'm Todd Myers, uh, application engineer here at uh, Go Engineer, and uh, my angel over my shoulder is Jay Panero, who is a uh, he is a PDM expert among being an expert at pretty much everything else. Uh, and Jack so what of we're all gonna, trades, that's how I always call that's myself. Exactly. But so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go through and talk about the the differences, really, more importantly, the similarities between the data management in the cloud and what you may be experiencing uh, or where you may have come from uh, in using SolidWorks PDM. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to present this full screen. So uh, F11 is going to maximize that. So if you're running out of space in the browser, uh, do that uh, 3D experience uh, tabs and widgets uh, work marvelously in uh, in a full screen mode. Okay, so uh, if you read the little tagline of uh, this presentation, we just talk about how change isn't easy and you get comfortable, but if you weren't the one making the decision to go to the 3D experience platform for your data, or you did and you still aren't sure about how to do things, this is pretty much for you. Uh, because right, we're stepping out of something that's familiar. We're, we're going to show you how you can uh, accomplish all of those important day-to-day, day-in-the-life tasks uh, in this same but different cloud-based PDM system. Um, and so it comes down to some common uses for PDM. Why do people get it in the first place? Really, the biggies are securely, uh, securely storing your data um, and version control. And beyond that, it's being able to navigate and collaborate, uh, interrogate your information. Um, and a lot of people, uh, even at the PDM standard level, like the ability to automatically create some, uh, some files, have those exported. Um, so I'm gonna kind of follow this thread, but nothing really um, formally. Uh, I'm just gonna go right in and show you an image of uh, the vault view from PDM and kind of present what you could make of this in the cloud, right, uh, through the, your browser. So here we've got the vault view. We are seeing uh, Windows Explorer at the top uh, running that with the uh, all your data. You've got your preview window in the bottom left. Uh, and then there's all of these windows that you can tab through, uh, right? Like preview, data card, version, all that bill of materials contains where used. All that is still at your disposal when you run this through the cloud. And so I'm just gonna tab over to this data tab that I have set up. And here we're just looking at this item right in the graphics area over here on the right this is my 3d play um, application um, and it's really handy for viewing virtually any kind of data you know images uh, uh, your your CAD geometry previews of PDFs and and things like that um, and this this is what I'm calling my well this is called the bookmark editor and so it's not a Windows structure that you're looking at in the cloud, but you can kind of replicate how that works. And this, this bookmark editor is much more powerful than just uh, like an Explorer window. All of the tools that you need to progress that data through a workflow, to share data with other people, uh, to edit the properties, all of that's available from this, this interface. Um, so you can expand uh, assemblies, we can drag and drop other information into this 3D play. You can pan, rotate, zoom. Uh, you can even do little exploded views um, and you know see how this, you know, expand this to get a good idea of what's contained inside here. Another really handy tool within this uh, is being able to filter. Uh, now, we have uh, presented on searching 
uh, earlier this summer, Randy did a great presentation on how to find your data since it's not in like a browser friendly or a uh, uh, like a database that that is set up in Windows Explorer. We use search and we use bookmarks to find our data. Uh, we can also get more information and filter those results by using what's called a tag. And you know, when we search by tags, we can go down and we can look for the maturity of items. So here we can see you know, what's in work, what's released, and you can filter these results uh, by these tags and colorize them so that a P, uh, like a project manager or someone that you know, is looking for something that needs to be completed can see, hey, most of this stuff's been released, uh, but here's an item that's uh, frozen. It needs me to review it. Um, sign off before it goes to the release date. And then there's some other items that are still in work. So it's a great handy tool for getting not just information about what's contained in uh, your assembly, but it's great at seeing the state that it's in. And you can also turn that off and, and check out, you know, who's got it locked. Uh, so you can see, you know, what's locked and what's unlocked. So there's a designer that's still working on these uh, components. All right, everything else uh, is available to be uh, modified or revved, uh, but just a, a good comparison to being able to preview that information. Um, another uh, thing Actually, you might want to- Before you go to that. Sure. The, the, there is an advantage in, to the cloud-based, and that is that in PDM on-premise, if you don't have a local version of the file the big preview below the uh, in the other interface you had shown doesn't work mm -hmm. when you go to click on the preview it actually has to go get the file and download the file locally which doesn't mm -hmm. have you know, obviously this is this is all cloud-based but you get that preview without having to worry about local versions of files right and i wouldn't have interrupted you if i could if i could have found my mute button just a half a second sooner <laughs> no, so my totally apologies fine. no 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 it's totally fine. Um, you know, the other nice thing, since we're on this topic still, is that you can, you know, click through here and you're going to get a highlight view of where the component actually is in the assembly. So, you know, you've got more interrogation tools, right, for your, your data. Um, while we're still in here, I wanted to look at the data cards. So if you're familiar with data cards, let's go down here and take a look. Uh, so data cards, right, in PDM. Coming back over here, that's as simple as clicking on the info button or clicking on the file, doing a right click and saying, you know, edit properties. So this is where we can see all the information that you want mapped from SolidWorks into the data card that's being managed in the cloud. And you can also push information from the cloud back into the SolidWorks files. So we've got some functionality that your admins can set up to push and pull that data back and forth uh, uh, between SOLIDWORKS and where it resides in the cloud. And we'll look at some of these other things here too uh, in this uh, properties tab in a second. Um, let's see here. If you needed to communicate some changes to uh, a colleague, you know, you can even transition this to create markups. So you can draw on screen, you can even turn this into a tool called 3D Markup, and you can create uh, permanent views of uh, the assemblies and the structure and notes. Um, so that's another benefit to doing it here, is that you can create permanent objects that can be used to communicate changes that need to occur. Um, and you can drag these assemblies into other viewing tools uh, to compare the revs. So uh, right here, I just wanted to look at the looking at the versions. If we go here to um, with this selected, I'm going to take a look at the versions I've got. Or the these are minor revs. So depending on how you like to work, you might want to be creating minor revs between major revs, and you can actually drag these into that viewer as well. So you can see like where this started, and then you can drag it uh, and see you know, what kind of was added step by step. If you used documentation to control what's changed, you can actually reference those changes too and see the history and the notes that people asked uh, or entered. Um, 
into those transitions. Um, let's see here. Another nice thing to do here is dragging this into the compare tool. So here I've got a tab I just named compare. And here's our app. I'm gonna maximize that on the screen. And I'm just gonna drag that assembly into compare. It's gonna ask us what we wanna compare. I wanna compare different revisions. So I'm going to compare the latest to the original and say OK. And then say compare. So any additional components that were added or removed or modifications to components throughout the process are going to be called out uh, graphically so that you can, you know, navigate and ascertain, you know, what has happened between rev x and rev x2 right and all this through the browser and everyone that's connected to the project can do this on their own uh to get a good idea of you know the the progress that the the project is making um if you need access to the bombs all right so there is a uh an included tool called uh explorer And I know I'm getting close to time here too. Uh, with this, you can get a CAD bomb. So it's very similar to uh, just getting uh, like a, a list of all the included components, but it's not giving you instances. So it's just showing you each different component in the assembly in a, a, a graph. And so then you can, I don't want to filter it, I just want to add it. And then you can export this bomb to uh, a CSV file uh, to be shared uh, with someone else on the team. Um, and then you can also copy references or paste references to the data from here. Uh, so if we take a look at these properties here we can see in the properties we've got a place for specification documents uh, or you can paste attachments um, you can upload directly from your drive and it's going to attach it here and this is all going to become searchable um, when you look at what is related to these assemblies and the components we because we can see the parent and child relationships um, we'll see that anything we attach to it as a reference is going to be uh, able to be found when we explore the relations. So all that to say, let me come back here and show you what I'm talking about. We have this relation explorer. Hmm. Don't know why I'm getting that because I do have a license on this tenant. I might have to do a refresh too. Let's see here. Okay, let's take a look at the relations for this guy. So this comes in, uh, it's just gonna show you an icon for that item or in a list here. And you can expand that and you can see like what is contained within. So you're gonna see the children and related documents that are pasted to it. Uh, or you're going to see the parents. So is this attached to any other project uh, or a bookmark that's organizing it or pointing at it? Um, a graphical view of this kind of illustrates this more like a chart. So we can click and see the parents and see the children. So as a, this is an assembly, we would expect to see all the components in that assembly. And you can see this kind of gets a little interesting to navigate, which you might want to switch to the graphical view when it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, 
while we still have a couple times, I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, let's see here. I want to show you the maturity graphs. Uh, when we're in PDM Pro, right, we have access to uh, pushing our data through um, a maturity cycle. And uh, here we can see an example of that. All right, so you've got different states that the data can reside in, and then you can set up different processes or approvals that it has to go through to get to released. Um, we have a similar yet different, same but different uh, functionality here uh, in the cloud. We have a simpler workflow. This is not really editable. It's configurable. Um, and when people see this, they're like, well, there's only a few states on there. Um, and that's true. But virtually everything that you need to do in a workflow can happen by attaching a route to your review and release process. So just with a piece of data here, going from in work to frozen, you can click this here and it's gonna say, all right, I'm gonna move that to the frozen state. Another maybe better term could be calling this in approval. You can, uh, you could change the names of these. So that's one of the things you can configure. But really controlling how this moves from frozen to released can be, uh, handled by attaching a route to it and so here you can get the sign offs of your engineers or your admins or your purchasing department um, and you simply attach that to the process and then each person is going to get a task if they're connected to this um hello trying to pan this over here um each person that's on this uh, workflow is going to be pinged when it's their turn to review and sign off. So that was a lot to pack into 15 minutes there, but um, just wanted to highlight at a high level the uh, the similarities um, that between the cloud PDM and what you may be familiar with through. Uh, PDM professional with SolidWorks and a uh, local on-premises solution. So yeah, thanks Todd. We do have one question if you wanna try to answer this for us. Sure, yeah. It uh, came from, uh, from David. He's asking, is there a mechanism to demote from obsolete to released or release to something editable? There is, uh, it's gonna be set up at, it through the admin tool, which is called the uh, the platform uh, manager. And uh, you would set up certain rules. So there are rules that you can apply to uh, progressing along that, that workflow in either direction. And so you can reject anyone that is below a certain level of permission. So we assign, uh, we assign people, um, yeah, we're gonna just search for one here physical products. Now well, let's see here. I don't want a bookmark. But uh, I'm I'm pretty it's, sure it's called like a engineering yeah engineering definition is the oh, one that physical product because it, right. it actually yep. controls more than just physical products it, it controls a bunch of different types of like CAD objects so it's that's like stuff it. that's in the engineering definition maturity graph yes thank you yep. um, so this is a basic uh, set of permissions and you can see here that going from in work to frozen it's not going to uh, be allowed if the person, or in this case, the data isn't all in the frozen state. So the data all has to be a certain level. Um, going from in work to released, right, that's rejected. Like if you just skip the review process, it's rejected on anyone who only has the author or read write access to the data. Same thing can happen in reverse, right? So you can create a rule that connects these different nodes and you can grant someone, like maybe only the admin is allowed to push something back down through the workflow. So kind of a follow-up to that, Todd. Um, mm -hmm. David is saying that they're currently running an on-premise 2021X and 
do not have this capability? Is this something that's new to 2022X or hmm. is it for cloud only? Something I, different from on-premise? It definitely existed on cloud in 2021X. So I, I'm not familiar with on-prem. Um, so I don't know, uh, but it's definitely worth looking at. If if you could do it, it would be right here. Um, yep. So I don't know if there's like more layers of 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 admin capabilities. So David, if you want to shoot me an email, uh, just I think there's a a contact or something with this webinar. It'll, it'll go to me <laughs> for for some reason. I'm not part of marketing, but I seem to be the one that gets the emails. Um, and I'll get you in contact with uh, someone from our team that does more with the on-premise and see if they can answer that for you. All right, those are the only two questions I saw, guys. Um, okay. We are at the end of our time, so I want to be respectful of our guests. But uh, Andy, Todd, Jay, greatly appreciate all that you did today. Um, I don't think we're going to have another meeting next month. Uh, we've just decided it's too too busy and, and stuff to try to fit in and, and uh, waiting on some other information that hasn't come in quite yet to, to share it with you. So uh, this will probably be our last one for 2022, uh, but we do hope to get this series started again early in 2023 and bring some new content. So uh, the guests that have attended, if you have other suggestions or ideas that you would like to see next year, uh, share those with us and we'd be happy to uh, get that put together or find someone who can speak to those particular topics. So um, again, guys, thank you. And um, everybody have a safe uh, holiday season coming up. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.